Okay, let's start. Uh, th this lecture is on um, deflation myth and reality. And uh, bef I guess to start with, I want to ask how many people think that, how many people like falling prices? How many people like low prices for consumers' goods? Yes. Okay. You're crazy if you don't raise your hand. Okay. How many people think it's good for the economy that if prices fall? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, that's, I don't think I have to talk. I mean, uh, <laughs> But I'll just give you some arguments for the position you've already established. Uh, so first of all, let me just start with defining um, deflation. Deflation used to mean, in the 19th century, a literal reduction in the money supply. Okay? Deflation refers to the, the reduction of a volume. And so that was the initial definition. Then in the early 20th century, there was a bit of a change. People began to call deflation a situation any time there is an insufficient money supply to um, serve the expanding needs of trade. That is, as the economy grew, uh, money, money had to grow sufficiently so that prices didn't fall. So in that case, the focus began to come in the second definition on a fall in prices. Okay? They still had the money supply in the definition. Okay, and today, unfortunately, the modern definition just talks about a fall in the price level as being deflation. Okay. The problem with that is that falling prices are just one of a number of important effects of a fall of, of, of a reduction in the money supply or an increase in the money supply. Okay. The same is true with the definition of inflation. Today all it means is a rise in, in, in some price index. Okay. Doesn't have it doesn't say anything about the fact that when you increase the money supply, you have a fall in interest rates. You have a redistribution of wealth from one group to another group. So the same thing is true with deflation. I will use this definition as we go on. That is a, a fall in, the, in general prices. Another term I want to introduce is the deflation phobia. Okay, and I think I was one of the first economists to use this term because uh, I wrote an article in the early 2000s um, criticizing Alan Greenspan. But I would define it as a morbid and irrational fear of falling prices. There's nothing you'd be afraid of when prices go down. You should be happy. You should be joyous, jumping with glee. Um, now, however, the central bank wants to promote deflation phobia. It wants the population to be afraid of falling prices because this allows them then to say, we have the cure. The cure is simply increasing the money supply. Um, so... Federal Reserve officials really promoted this, this, this whole idea of, of being afraid of, 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 of deflation. We hadn't had deflation since the early 1930s. And suddenly, in the early 2000s, mysteriously, we, we, or not so mysteriously, we, we had central bankers suddenly trying to scare people about the prospect, not the actual existence, but the prospect of falling prices. Why would they do that? Well, the economy had been in a recession and the economy was, was recovering slowly, and they wanted to pump money into the economy. So, so they wanted an excuse for this. So now they, they use Fed speak. Fed speak is a form of talk, speech in which you make very equivocal, obscure, and ominous statements without really saying much. So for example, in a speech that was at the time no one took note of, um, before business group, this was in November 2002, a Greenspan, who then was only on the board, of, he was a, uh, on the board of governors of the Fed. He wasn't the chair. He said, notice how, how this flows. The chance of a significant deflation in the United States in the foreseeable future is extremely small. Okay, Ben, move on. Okay, it's extremely small. We have to worry about it. But then he comes back to it and he says, the Fed would take whatever means necessary to prevent, now he's using the word significant deflation in the United States, who said anything about that? And has sufficient, sufficient policy instruments to ensure that any deflation that might occur would be both mild and brief. Okay. So now he's saying, well, in case it's not very small, you know, we have tools. You know, we'll protect you. And then he ends, so having said that deflation in the United States is highly unlikely, I would be imprudent to rule, rule out the possibility altogether. Not, as I said, not many people took note of this speech. Um, but 2002, when 2002 ended, it was one of the lowest infla uh, inflation rates that we had had 
um, in, in the past 20 years, it was 1.6% prices had risen. It was still inflation, prices had risen. Um, that means that prices would have doubled in 45 years. So there's still inflation there, okay? So this almost seemed like a, a trial balloon, okay? Now, now you have Greenspan, who is as confused as he looks, okay, so, um, in this pick, um, character here. So he picked this thread up uh, a few months later in, in testimony before Congress at two different times. He says, a further drop in inflation would be an unwelcome development. So he was the best at Fed speak. What does that, what does that mean, an unwelcome development? And then a little bit later, a few days later, he said, after, by the way, the um, inflation rate had come out for, that mo for the month before and there had been a slight decline in prices, okay, just for that one month. Uh, and so he says, we see no credible possibility that we will at any point run out of monetary am ammunition to address problems of de deflation, okay? So he's mixing his metaphors, monetary ammunition to address something. I mean, you don't address somebody by shooting him or her, okay? Um, what, does he, what can he possibly mean here, okay? He's, he doesn't, the meaning is intentionally not clear. It's intentionally nonsensical, but the key is he's trying to scare people, right? I mean, he's talking about monetary ammunition. He's talking about problems of inflation. When you talk about ammunition, it means that, well, you have a serious problem if you have to use ammunition to, to fight it, okay? So the media, of course, immediately jumps on the bandwagon, okay? Uh, financial writers, media commentators, celebrity economists, um, and so on, uh, they began to write articles and blog posts. Now, I went through some of these, um, and these are the actual titles. The Deflation Monster Still Lives. The Specter Ghost of, of Deflation. Why We Should Fear Deflation. The Deflation Boogeyman wants the Fed. These are actual titles of articles. The greatest threat facing the U.S. economy, deflation, and defeating deflation, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a threat. It's right there. They're, they're saying that it's, it's at hand. You say, you know, we're defeating deflation. Uh, the deflation dilemma, to be concerned or not to be concerned, and so on and so forth. So, of course, the media's jumped on this. So now everyone's afraid of deflation, okay? Or everyone be, ha, had begun to become fearful of deflation. And so the Fed then reinforced it all by picking the terminology up and, and using deflation in its pronouncements. You know, we're, we're, we're getting close to deflation. So the whole thing was they began to focus on inflation not being too low. Now that we have people afraid of, of, of deflation, we don't want inflation being too low because it might turn into deflation. So now you had to be afraid of low inflation. And, and I think um, the head of the uh, uh, European Union um, uh, coined the term uh, lowflation, okay, which is inflation, okay. Okay. All right, so what causes deflation? Well, money is a good like any other good, whether it's fiat currency or gold, uh, it's value. And it's value in terms of what it can purchase of, other good, of all the other goods and services in the economy. It's value determined by supply and demand. So there's two ways that you could have deflation from two sides. You could have it on the demand side. That could cause falling prices. If people produce more goods and they all try to sell more goods and nothing else changes, there's the same amount of money in the economy, well, then the, the exchange demand for money has gone up. People demand more money, and so prices, the value of money will go up, which means prices will fall, okay? Or if people want to hold more money in relation to their incomes and in relation to prices, okay, um, rather than, than invest or, and spend it, okay, that's, an in, that's also an increase in the demand for money. It's an increase in the demand to hold money, okay? So we demand money in two different ways, by selling things that we have for money and getting money in our, into our possession, or by holding on to the money and spending less of it than we had previously. The other way that, that, that prices can fall, that we can have deflation in the modern sense of the word, uh, is if the Fed reduces the amount of reserves in the economy, okay? And, and that'll be a, you know, a cold day in hell before that happens. It hasn't happened um, since you know, the 1930s. Um, or in some cases, the, uh, the, the central bank could also demonetize 
um, certain bills, like the, the, the Indian government did that um, a couple of years ago. Okay, but, but, but deflation from the supply side ra rarely occurs, from the supply of money side, rarely occurs, occurs. Rarely do central banks reduce absolutely the supply of money in the economy. Okay, so what are the kinds of deflation? I, I wrote an article on this um, uh, back in, in, in the early 2000s, uh, uh, talking about the different kinds of deflation. Um, one kind of deflation which we'll talk about is growth deflation. Another, which I'll, I'll get to, um, is called cash building or speculative deflation. Okay, and I'll, I'll get to that. And the third kind is the kind that the government imposes on its people um, to reverse effects of past inflation. But I'm not, I won't get to that uh, today. But the first two, two kinds are benign, okay? They're good for the economy. They're a natural outcome of a, a progressive capitalist economy, okay? The third, since it's undertaken by government, is really an infringement on property rights that distorts the economy, okay? So I'm going to address three myths that have to do with the first two kinds of, of um, deflation. So the first is if the money supply does not grow fast enough, prices will fall, and stifle economic growth. Okay, so let me give you the reality. Falling prices are the natural outcome of growth. Okay, they don't stop growth. In fact, they're one of the benefits of, of economic growth. Okay, in, 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 a, in a dynamic capitalist economy where there is increasing capital investment, improvements in technology, intensification of the division of labor, where we divide up labor even more finely. Okay. If you, as long as you have those things happening and the money supply is restrained by some market money, like a, a commodity like gold or silver that has a supply and demand based in the market, okay, then you'll get naturally falling prices. So um, this is just repeating what I've said. So growth deflation is caused um, by an increase in the production and supply of goods. Okay, as more goods and services come onto the economy, Okay, the supplies of these goods and services individually increase and their prices begin to fall. Okay, we call that economic growth. Um, and, that's, and that's caused by technological progress, uh, more investment in, in capital goods, which makes labor more productive. productive. Okay, well, if you have more robots um, aiding and assembling cars, each worker is, 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 is able to produce more cars per unit of time. Um, and the increase in the amount of goods in the economy causes an increase in the competition among different sellers of different goods for dollars, okay? If you have the same amount of dollars in the economy and people are all trying to sell more goods, well, that's great. Then prices will fall, okay? And if, as has happened in the 19th century under the gold standard, if the money supply increases very slowly because of the high cost of mining gold, well, then you will see this actual fall in prices, okay? The um, increase in the amount, in the um, rate of, 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 of production of goods will exceed the incre rate, increase in the rate of the money supply, okay? And prices will therefore fall, okay? Okay, so let's look at the history of, the defl of deflation in the U.S. Um, just like many other market economies, prices fell in the U.S. throughout the 19th, throughout the 19th century. Um, the reason being that the rate of economic growth exceeded the rate of increase of the money supply because we, for the most part, throughout that century had a gold standard. And it was a good, good, a good what we call a good deflation. Okay? And, and many mainstream economists are coming around to the view that at least growth deflation is a good deflation. You can even see some articles in Fed journals talking about this. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis their economists refer to prices that fall as they ha had in China because more and more goods are being produced is a good deflation. Okay? And of course it's good because it makes, even if our, our incomes, our, our salaries and wages don't change okay, in nominal terms, it, each dollar buys more. Okay? So to give you an example, in the, the period that was the great period of greatest economic growth in U.S. history from 1880 to 1896, prices fell by 30%. Every, every year that meant, on average, prices were almost 2% lower than they were the year before. I mean, can you imagine the price of automobiles going down today? The prices of, we'll get to other goods where prices do fall. Uh, but yet, did that stifle economic growth? Did that choke it off? No, because real GDP during that, that, that period grew by 85% or 5% per year. Today, 
we struggle to have um, a, 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 a rate of growth that can reach 3% per year. Okay. Let's take a little bit longer period. From 1870 to 1898, wholesale prices dropped by 34%. Um, consumer prices fell by 47%. Consumer prices were almost cut in half during that period. Okay? They fell at a rate of 2.5% per year. Um, real, but real gross national product grew during that period at 4.5%. And everybody consumed more. Not only did they save more, but they consumed more. So consumption jumped by 2.3% per year. So let's take a look at the price level. If you'll note, um, in 1800, the prices began to rise, or fell for a little while, then it began to rise. And then we had the War of 1812. Government pumped money into the economy. We had a credit expansion. We had a, um, a boom and then a recession. And then gold was reinstated, OK, because the banks were permitted to continue to operate and issue their notes and deposits without paying people their gold, without, without redeeming their notes in gold. But once gold, gold redeemability was restored, we see the gold standard operating. And what happened, prices fell from an index of 200 down to an index of, of 100. So prices fell during that period. By, and they fell by 53% from you know, 1819 to around the Civil War, at which time, oh, there, uh, it, it, there's a little blip there, if you notice, right here. Um, the price began to rise, um, and that was as a result of uh, the bank, uh, the Second Bank of the United States, which in 1832 uh, was vetoed. Its charter was vetoed, so it wasn't renewed. Uh, by President Jackson. And then after that, we had a, an influx of silver into fractional reserve banks and uh, an influx from China and from other countries, Mexico. And that caused more notes to be produced. And we had another uh, um, inflation, inflationary boom, and then a recession. Okay, But outside of the periods where we had this, these paper money inflations, and then up to the Civil War, where the, the Civil War was, was financed by a huge paper money inflation, prices had fallen. And then when we restored the gold standard in, in, in 1879, uh, prices then began to fall again under the classical gold standard. And once again, they were cut in half. They went from 200 to an index number of 100, OK? And the American economy grew between the end of the Civil War to World War I right, to become the greatest industrial, went from an agricultural economy to the greatest, greatest industrial power in the United States. Uh, I'm sorry, in the world, OK? So let's look at some instances of you know, what we might call good deflation. We all love HDTVs. Many, many of us have taken advantage of, of LASIK eye surgery. And of course, we're all you know, wedded to our, 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 our uh, PCs and tablet computers and so on. Well, let's look at, at, at how these, um, uh, these different industries have fared in terms of prices and, and in terms of, of gro growth. So um, a mainframe computer, uh, which would probably fill this room, yeah, uh, back in uh, 1970, an IBM computer, um, and w would, uh, would take a number of people to operate, um, was $4.7 million. Okay? And, and today, PCs are 20 times faster and, and have more memory than these huge mainframes, OK? Yet they sell for you know, less than $500 with, with their accessories, all right? So what happened? You would expect if prices fell from $4.7 million to $500, wouldn't, wouldn't that scare a neoclassical economist? Wouldn't we be, af be afraid the whole industry would collapse? But of course, for Austrians, the importance isn't what prices of the output does, but the margin between prices and the cost of production. Okay. So obviously, there was tremendous technological improvement, tremendous capital investment in this industry, which lowered costs and made it more and more profitable. So uh, prices fell by 90% between 1980 and 1999. And in 1980, it was only half a million PCs shipped. By 1999, 43 million were shipped. We've had further declines in prices since 1999. And by 2013, you had um, 315 million shipped, OK? So the, 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 from 1999 to 2013, the industry increased sixfold. Right? PC memory prices used to be $6.48 per megabyte. 
1980, and they declined to less than one cent, okay, per megabyte uh, by 19 by 2014, okay. So costs fell as prices fell, okay. The fall in costs made it more profitable to produce PCs, and you had people rushing in, new, new entrepreneurs rushing in to produce PCs, new companies starting, older companies increasing the amount that they're producing, and all of that caused the supply of PCs to increase and prices to fall naturally. This is natural. And who benefited? The companies benefited from higher profits, and we all benefited, okay, as consumers. Uh, here's hard drive prices, okay. Um, in 1980, they were near a million dollars, okay, for um, a gigabyte of hard drive. Uh, by 2009, they had fallen to less than 10 cents, right? So that was due to capital investment and, and um, technological improvements. Uh, there in 1980, you have a huge, now that weighs 4, 000, over 4,000 pounds, okay? It's a disk drive system. Um, and it, it, it's 20 gigabytes, 20 gigabytes, okay? And it costs between $700,000 and um, a little over a million dollars, okay? And then you can see by 2010, a 32 gigabyte um, chip had an estimated value of between $100 and 150, okay, compared to a million, and it weighed one thousandth of a pound, okay? And you can see how small they are now, okay, these chips. What about HDTVs? Um, 32 million television sets were sold in North America um, for an average price of $400, okay, and they had an average size of 27 uh, inches, um, diagonal inches. And then by 2015, 44 million sets were sold. That is, the industry increased. Um, the price stayed, the price increased for a set, but per inch, okay, per, di per diagonal inch, the price fell from $14.81 to $12.10. There was a long-term fall in prices. The first HDTV was sold in Japan for $36,000 back in 1990, and uh, prices have come down until today. You can get one for, you know, $500 of much greater quality, okay? So why should we be afraid? Okay, if inflation is good, deflation is good in particular industries, all the economy is is made up of, of different industries and different firms in those industries. Why shouldn't it be good for the economy as a whole? Well, it is. It is good. Okay? There's nothing wrong with it. Defla the deflation phobia has no basis in fact whatsoever. Um, and then a laser eye surgery and cosmetic surgery, uh, the, uh, laser eye surgery um, started in 1992, but 1998 was 4,000 per eye. That's a mistake in 2013. Um, I, I updated the figures here for, 2013, uh, for 2018, it was $2,000 per eye. That should have been 3,000. So was, uh, the price of laser eye surgery was cut in half, okay? Botox treatments went from um, $365 um, for much, for, for, for a treatment that was sort of backward and so on until today, um, you can find it on, on discount websites for, you know, $149 and so on. Though the average price today is probably still around $375. Liposuction um, also went down in price, um, but the, uh, there's more, they do more complicated procedures today, so the price is higher. But, but for the quality that you get, it, um, it is per, per unit of quality, the price has fallen. Okay, so that's growth deflation. And um, I, I mean, I defy any economist, any mainstream economist, to explain why that should be bad. Um, and, and what they do is, well, they say, well, you know, if, the, if, if prices fall, if we have deflation, then at some point, um, the interest rate will reach zero uh, and, and can't go below zero um, to take into account a, a, a big deflation. But the point is, why would people just speculate on, on, on interest rates? If people really expected prices to fall, okay, in the future, and therefore took that into account when they were, were, were taking out loans, that each dollar they paid back would be, would be 
would, would um, be worth more and therefore that they, they, they want to pay a lower interest rate. Well, then, if that were true, why don't the same people take into account the fact that the prices will fall in the future and therefore hold back their expenditures and not, and not purchase, which means that prices would fall um, instead of interest rates. Okay, that's, that's the point that Murray Rothbard makes in his book, Man, Economy, and State, and I recommend that you look at that. I mean, it's a little more technical. I don't want to get into it here. Okay. So let's talk about um, uh, the second myth, which is uh, deflation prolongs and intensifies recessions because we tend to have a lot of falling prices do, uh, or, or law, uh, greatly falling prices during a, a, a recession. Okay. So the claim is made that it turns recession into a deep depression of the kind that we had um, during the Great Depression. But in fact, as Austrian economists have shown, deflation is exactly the cure for the recession, and it speeds up the recovery from the recession. Okay? In fact, it prevents recessions from, from degenerating in, in, into, um, in, into full-blown recessions. So what is speculative deflation? Well, that's a situation where after an inflationary boom, at the top of an inflationary boom, price, the wages and, and, and costs of production have been bid very high, and the central bank cuts back on its increase in the money supply. So suddenly now, costs are too high for prices. Right? So in a, under a gold standard, prices would immediately fall because entrepreneurs would, not, would, 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 would stop buying inputs, they would stop buying labor, and, and because they didn't want to pay the high wages and so on, it wasn't profitable. And you would have an adjustment of costs to prices and a reestablishment of profits. But in modern times, with labor unions, minimum wages, and, and so on, other government interventions, um, it takes a while for, for wages to fall. Right? But in any case, the, the, the deflation of wages is a good thing. Okay? Wages need to fall and other costs need to fall so that you reestablish the profit margin. Okay? It's not high prices, as I said before, that spurs investment. Okay? What spurs investment is the prospect that the price, whatever the price of product may, is going to be, is higher than the, the cost so that there is a profit to be made. Okay? Or at least there's um, an interest return to be made, that, that uh, return, a return on the money invested. So bottom line is that entrepreneurs would rather hold cash Okay, and refrain from purchasing labor and investing in, in capital goods and so on until costs have come down in relation to prices. So it's not, we don't need a deflation of all prices and, uh, uh, during a, 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 a recession or, or a depression. Okay, what we need is a deflation of those prices that have been bid artificially high. Okay. So deflation is a good way of, 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 of reestablishing profit margins. And also from the point of view of households, all right, households are now worried about not getting their bonuses at work or, or actually having their wages cut and salaries cut or even getting laid off. So they're very uncertain about the future, the future prospects of their income. So as a result, what, what they'll do is they'll hold money rather than spend it on consumer goods. Okay. They also expect prices to fall because they see falling prices around them. They expect them to fall more. And so they'll hold money until prices have fallen. Okay. It's only when the prices fall to expect what people expect them to be, both businesses and households, that they'll begin spending money again. So the best thing that can happen is that price can fall very rapidly. Okay. The best thing that can happen from the point of view of recovering from a recession or depression. Okay. To try to hold them up, through government programs, through monetary policy, just prolongs the recovery from the recession. And that's exactly what has happened from the, uh, as a result of, of government policies in the recession of, of, of 2007 through, through 2009, which we really have just re recovered from a year or two ago. That is, we've just reached the point that we were at before 2007, before the financial meltdown. So let's talk a little, let me give you a, a case study here, um, uh, the Forgotten Depression of 1920-21. That used to be called the Great Depression. That was called the Great Depression. Because people hadn't seen anything like it, okay, anything as deep as that depression before. Of course, it was caused by Fed monetary policy. 
Uh, the, remember, the, the, um, the Federal Reserve System had been established in 1914 um, by an act of, of, of uh, Congress and that was signed by President Woodrow Wilson. And by 19, they, they began to cut the reserve ratio, which allowed banks to lend out a greater proportion of, of, of their deposits. Uh, they began to inject reserves into the system. They began to centralize the reserves. That is, all the gold was um, uh, mandated. It was mandated that all the gold that the banks were holding should be held at the Federal Reserve, their local Federal Reserve banks, and that they would hold uh, Federal Reserve notes as backing. In any case, this allowed the Fed, these policies allowed the Fed to increase the money supply by over 15% per year, which is extremely high. Under the gold standard, if prices went up by 1% a year for a number of years, that was considered a large inflation, okay? There was a situation from 1896 to 1913 in which prices rose from 18, I think it was, 18, well, prices rose during, yeah, from 1896 to 1940, prices rose by, by a total of, of 13%. That, that is less than 1% per year, and everyone thought that was a great, great um, inflation. Okay, 13% over like 15 or 16 years. Because under gold standard, prices tended to fall every year. People weren't used to prices going up at all. In any case, um, the U.S. product prices rose, um, the GDP deflator, okay, that is products produced here in the U.S., both consumer goods and capital goods, they rose by about 15% per year for about four years, five years. And then consumer prices rose by about 14% per year. And then uh, the, uh, when, when, when the Fed tightened up on the money supply, stopped increasing it as rapidly, um, and in fact actually deflated it, uh, there, was, there was a depression. It was fairly, and it was deep. So total spending in the economy, which is uh, nominal GNP, total spending in the economy fell by 24%. Okay? That's one-fourth of spending just disappeared um, from uh, 1920 to, to, to 1921. Okay? So spending went from 91 billion all the way down to 69 billion, and real GNP, the real output of goods and services, shrunk by nearly 10 percent during that time. That's a very deep recession or depression. Okay, and unemployment shot up to 15 percent, and we had a, a steep de deflation in in the, in the monetary sense too. The money supply grew by about 2.9 percent which was very low compared to, remember, it was growing at 15% before that in 1920, and then it actually shrunk. The Fed actually allowed the money supply to, to decrease in, uh, in 1921 by 7%. General prices fell very steeply, 16.6% in 21, and 8.1% 8, 8 in 1922. Uh, consumer prices fell, okay, you can see there, um, and wholesale prices were cut in half. They fell very rapidly and very steeply. Okay, from mid 1920 to mid 1921, and wages fell a little bit more slowly over those two years. Okay, the fact that wages fell by only 11 percent means that people's real wages were actually going up during that period of time. At least those people who were successful in maintaining their jobs. And that comes from James Grant's book, uh, which I recommend to everyone. It's written. He's a very good writer. It's written for the layperson, uh, the Forgotten Depression. Okay. So the, 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 despite its depth, okay, and, and the depth of or how, how steeply prices fell and how steeply um, the G GNP, was then called GNP, declined, um, it was over after only 18 months. In fact, there was debates in Congress going on that maybe we should do, uh, uh, um, pass laws to implement public works, have people, you know, um, build dams and, and uh, build new highways and so on. But by the time... I mean, by the time they arrived at any kind of conclusion, they had not yet arrived at the, uh, any kind of conclusion or, any, or introduced any bill. The recession was over, okay? But yet contrast that with the Great Depression, which lasted um, until 1940. That is, we didn't recover from, from that recession until 1940, okay? Uh, and what was the reason for that? Well, unlike the 2021 episode, the 1929 Depression was um, confronted by government wanted to do something, an activist government. So both Herbert Hoover, then later um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, interfered in the labor market, minimum wages, forced collective bargaining, getting businesses together and making them pledge not to cut their wages. So product prices couldn't fall. Um, 
product, in product markets, there were pr the price supports to keep the prices of agricultural products up while people were going hungry. They were, they were destroying um, different crops and so on to reduce supply and keep prices up. Um, mo the mo money, uh, during the 1930s, we went off the gold standard in 1933. And we had a, 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 a monetary standard that was decided by how Franklin Roosevelt felt each day when he got up and set the price of gold at a different price, okay? Which uh, we, we devalued the dollar, that is, we inflated, trying to keep prices up. And then we had higher taxes and more and more regulations and so on. So all of those things interfered with the adjustment process. And now may, some, may, some mainstream economists, very heroically, have begun to say that um, the monetarists are wrong. It wasn't a failure of monetary policy. So the monetarists, who are, tend to be free market economists, claim the Great Depression resulted from government allowing the money supply to shrink, which it did for only in a few quarters, okay, uh, in the early 1930s. Whereas these other mainstream economists, one of whom is named Lee Ohanian, a uh, famous macroeconomist from UCLA, have pointed out that it's not monetary policy failure, it was labor market policy failure. The unions uh, implementing a, a minimum wage for the first time and uh, other interferences by the Hoover administration, which got businesses together and pledged to cut, not to cut wages, okay. So people are starting to come around somewhat, the mainstream, or at least some of them, uh, to, to the, to, to the um, um, Misesian and Rothbardian view of depressions. But what's very interesting, back, this is, this is from 1974, what did the Keynesians say about 1920-21? Well, they pretty much didn't say anything about it. But I did find something by um, uh, an expert on business cycle theory, a Keynesian expert back in 1974. Here's what he wrote when, when he talked about this. He said, the downswing was severe, but relatively short. Its outstanding feature was the extreme decline in prices, so we admit prices collapsed. Government policy to moderate the depression and, the sp and speed recovery was minimal. The government didn't do anything, didn't run deficits. Did, uh, the central bank didn't increase the money supply. In fact, they decreased the money supply, as we saw. Um, the Federal Reserve authorities were largely passive, nor was any use made of fiscal policy. The federal budget was deflationary while the downswing was in pro progress. That is, it was balanced. You had a balanced budget. Um, and then he concludes, despite the absence of a stimulative government policy, however, recovery was not long delayed. But if you go on and continue to read, he doesn't explain why. He doesn't explain how that could happen given the Keynesian framework that depressions are caused by a lack of aggregate demand, as Professor... Um, uh, Professor Newman One, uh, who is Jonathan Newman, uh, had told us, okay, the good Newman. Uh, no, anyway, um, and then let me finish up with the myth, myths and reality three. Um, there, the empirical evidence supposedly, this is the myth, shows a strong link between deflation and depression. When you get deflation, a depression will follow, okay? It's not long before you get a depression. What's the reality? Well, there's been two or three really good studies now by mainstream economists, well, one by an Austrian and, and two by mainstream economists, um, that, 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 sh that point out that aside from the Great Depression in the years 1929 to, to 1934, there is absolutely no empirical evidence or link between uh, deflation and depression, okay? The, 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 the Great Depression is, as they say, in econometrics an outlier, okay? So, let me just show you um, this graph and just a couple of other graphs before I end. If you notice, the solid line is the uh, total output in the U.S. economy, okay? And notice that it increases from 1800, okay, pretty steadily with a few dips, okay, all the way through 2000, okay? But notice what, what happens to prices, okay? Prices are the, shown, indicated by the dotted line. Okay, so prices fall from about 1819, okay, to, to about um, 1860, and then they fall again for, from after the Civil War. But notice that no matter what prices are doing, which way they're going, there is no correlation between the two. Output just keeps growing, except, and I don't know if you can see it here, uh, except right here where we have the Great Depression, okay, and, and, and you have a deflation here, okay? But otherwise, prices and, and output are not correlated. 
So there was an empirical study by two economists, and um, that was uh, used 16 countries over 100 years, uh, and, these, and, and, and these episodes were broken into five-year periods, and it covered 73 episodes of deflation and 29 depression episodes. And they found that excluding the Great Depression, 65 of the 73 deflation episodes involved absolutely no depression, while 21 of the 29 depression episodes were not associated with deflation. Okay? So in other words, 90% of deflation episodes did not result in depression. That was in the American Economic Review, the Papers and Proceedings, which is in the top 10. Okay? Uh, uh, the American Economic Review is the, the top-ranked journal, but its proceedings is sort of still in the top 10. That is the papers that are given at, at, at conferences. Um, the author's conclusion, the data suggests that deflation is not closely related to depressions. A broad historical outlook finds more periods of deflation with reasonable growth than with depression, okay, and many more periods of depression with inflation than with, with deflation. Overall, the data show virtually no link between deflation and depression. Well, Wall Street could have told you that. You didn't have to go through all of this. Um, and then there was a, 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 a great article, and, and um, I'm going to really uh, pump up this article because it was, it, was, uh, it was published in our journal, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics that I edit, um, by a, a, a young Czech economist, um, which was even more comprehensive than the um, article by Atkinson and Keogh. He, uh, Riska, Pavel Riska, Riska studied 20 countries from 1804 to 2015. He used annual data, not not average of five-year data. So he had 32, over 3,200 observations. He had to throw out 1,000 observations for various reasons. So he had over 2,000 observations. And um, I just want to get to what he found. He, he basically found the average annual output growth for inflationary years was 2.85%. For deflationary years, 2.73%. Um, it's slightly smaller, but it's statistically insignificant. There's really no difference between the two. So there's no difference in performance of the economy with deflation or inflation, right? Um, there's one other point I wanted to make here. And once you throw out the Great Depression, which is an outlier, okay, which is unlike all the other, um, uh, all, all the other episodes, and which we know uh, involve heavy government, invo heavy government intervention, once you throw that out, um, you get Riska's conclusion. The Great Depression stands out as the only episode in the sample with a statistically and economically significant relationship between output and prices. Um, when one leaves out the Great Depression, which represents only 90 out of the 2,000 observations, um, the correlations between inflation and output growth in the rest of the sample lose their significance entirely. And that means that, that there's, no, there's almost no correlation. It's almost, it's almost a zero correlation between um, falls in output and um, the... Uh, Fall in prices, deflation and depression. Okay, uh, and then when you you do have a positive correlation between deflation and depression, but only during the Great Depression. Okay, so let me. I'll end there, and um, we have a minute for a question. If someone has a question, I'll answer one. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, what do you make of uh, India's uh, confiscation program? Yeah, well, what they did was they, they uh, the, what were the notes? I th actually had, a, well, I, I, I didn't really want to do this, but um, uh, let's see. So they, they got rid of the fi 501,000 rupee note, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what, what they did was that they made people, um, forced people to go to banks, turn in the notes, and, but, and, and they gave the money in their accounts that they could withdraw different money. But again, they limited how much you could take out so that's a deflation, okay? That, that, that's a forced deflation. And it, it interferes with people's property rights, and it distorts the economy, okay? Trade slowed down because of, the, of these lack of, of small notes, okay? So, I mean, that's, why, that, that's an argument to get, just get rid of, separate government from money. Just like we, separate, we, want, or we say we separate religion in the United States from government, we have to separate money from government okay? completely. Uh, and so th these types of things won't happen. And, and, and stop collecting government statistics so no one will ever know if we have a deflation, which I, I love, which I tell my students about. People worry about the balance of trade deficit in the United States. So I say, well, I say, well what state do you live in? And they, you know, they say, well, I live in New York. I say, okay, what's the balance of trade deficit? 
So I don't know. Because they don't collect the statistics. So many states have bounce of trade deficits with other, other states and, and so on. Okay? Get rid of, the, get rid of these, government, these government statistics. I mean, allow businesses to collect statistics that are germane to their economic activity. Okay, last question real quick. They're scared of deflation because it would, well, it depends on what kind of exchange rate they have. That's another story. But if they had a fixed exchange rate, lower prices in their country would, would, would spur their exports. It would be cheaper, okay, if, if it was a fixed exchange rate. Okay. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>